Trevor, I, I read the most amazing thing in one of the press releases for the new album, Rio. Has it really been 34 years since Can't Look Away? You know, it's really hard to believe. Um, and it feels like yesterday because, you know, once I moved from yes to doing film scores, um, one of my earlier films was uh, my first uh, Jerry Brockheimer movie, which was Con Air. And uh, I was 30 odd years was years ago and it feels like yesterday so uh, I guess I can say one of my excuses is it doesn't feel like 34 years <laughs> um, but on the other hand um, having spent so long and still keeping up playing and you know and then I did uh, Anderson Raven Wakeman tour and my hands were in good shape after that and, and my voice and uh, so when I got to do the album, it was kind of perfect storm. Everything s seemed to zone in, uh, including obviously inspiration. Otherwise, what are we doing here? <laughs> right? <clears throat> yeah. Well, I'll yeah. tell you, um, I, I love this. I love the new record. It's. Oh, it's, thanks so much, man. You know, my my first thought, like, because I was also thinking about when I actually review the record, you know, and write something about that as well. I'm feeling like. If if your nine zero one two five era lineup had continued after talk, this is what that band could have sounded like. I mean, it was there were you definitely channeled some of your so many great influences. But you know, I the first thing I noticed, even right from the very first single, it was like, my God, Trevor, you're channeling Chris on bass. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny. There's um, a number of people have said that, which is you know, obviously. Uh, a compliment um, and uh, I must say I just with this album I just let myself be as free as I could and and just did what I, I, I figured I'd been doing all my life which is just play and not think too much about it and <clears throat> it's funny Vinny Kaliuta the drummer on the, the song Push said to me um he said, you know, if you're thinking about the music, you can't do it. So don't think about it. And uh, I didn't quite understand that until um, now. And, and and now I get it. It's uh, you've got to let the stuff channel through. Sorry. Hang on one sec. Are you off? I'll see you later. Sorry, it's my son just leaving for a session. <laughs> uh, yeah. Now, I guess he played drums on some of this record as well. Yeah, he was. He inspired me on a lot of things, and um, uh, he, he's just such a great um, bouncing board for me. You know, he's uh, and e extremely opinionated. You know what happens to fathers? I remember telling him a, um, a story when I was twelve, when he was twelve years old, and uh, at the end of the story, and it was just you know kind of semi philosophical nonsense, but. Uh, at the end, he said, Dad, you're so smart. And I thought, oh, that's really so sweet of him. And then once he turned 15, and since then, I've been a complete idiot, right? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, God, I, I, I don't always get that from my kids. So, so well, so there you, well, you're, there you're you know go. Exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, very nice. Um, so, so tell me, you know, what, you know, what was the inspiration that, like, you know, that made you really sit down to to put Rio together, like where <clears throat> I'd been, well, there were certain ideas that have had, had, had been kind of percolating for years. Uh, one of which was, you know, when I watched the TV many years ago and saw the bombing of Oklahoma, it kind of freaked me out. Um, you know, coming from the, the depths of despair with apartheid and then moving to this, you know, this free country and this incredible, you know, the bastion of everything good coming to America and seeing that kind of freaked me out a bit. And um, I started writing words down um, and it turned into this kind of, not chant, but this lyric about Oklahoma and this kind of heartfelt sorrow, if you like, for for what those people had gone through and the the evil of what had happened and 
So that was on the burner for a long time, but I didn't want to do it then because it's, you know, it's it's kind of crass and calculated. So I thought, I'm certainly not doing anything then. And, um, uh, but now I think the time is, um, it's kind of appropriate. It's, it's not going to freak uh, anyone out too much. Uh, I mean, and whoever's going through the pain is never going to end going through the pain of losing people. But um, I just thought it was something I had to do. So that was, I guess that was the kind of start of uh, doing stuff. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and there were a number of other little things. I actually did some drum tracks with Lou Molino very earlier on. And, um, but the, the essence of what happened was two years ago, just saying to myself, okay, I'm not taking on any more films until I've got an album done. My wife would constantly say to me, when are you doing your record? It's, you know how long it's been. And then she noticed that when we went for dinner, there were times when she'd be talking to me and suddenly she'd say, you're not listening, all are you? <laughs> and I'd say, what do you mean? She said, you, you're completely thinking of music and she'd hand me a piece of paper and a pen. I'd write out five lines and I'd jot down a couple of notes and she was totally right. And I, I really, for the last two years, I'd been thinking this maybe a little more. And, um, and once I started, I was as disciplined as I've ever been. And, and uh, it was fresh for me because I hadn't done it for so long. And I thought, I'm just going to do everything that I want to do stuff I want to do. I don't care about genre. I don't care about the demographics because I hope that at the end of the day, whatever it is, it'll sound like I'm doing it because I, you know, I do what I do. So it's unlikely it's going to sound too much different. And so that's, it was kind of enjoyable visiting, you know, like country music and D uh, different genres but yeah i focused in and and i just really got it done i i guess that discipline came from movies because you know if if you say to a director i'm not feeling it this week um i'll get onto it next week uh they'll say okay well you you go ahead have your holiday we're getting somebody else <laughs> you don't have that option it's a, there's a blank page in front of you and you need to fill it at least most days um and you know, thematically, it's 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 a traumatic thing if you're not coming up with stuff because you don't have that option. You can't take a break. You have to come up with stuff. And uh, I think that discipline after fifty films, um, it was instilled in me, and uh, I really worked hard and and got it done. And and just absolutely, um, you know, I was kind of exploding if you like uh because i hadn't done it for so long yeah well you know it, it's it's great because in in so many ways this is the ultimate progressive rock album because by its very nature you covered so many different styles and genres of music across it that you know that no one you know that the only way to describe it is is progressive um <clears throat> I'm so happy to hear you say that because I must be honest, when I first, you know, the funny thing is when I was doing Anderson, Rabe and Wakeman, I, uh, Thomas the uh, uh, from Inside uh, Out uh, Records had wanted to sign us and there was no chance of doing a record. We we, we kind of dabbled in a couple of things and then the, the tour started. So we never really got, uh, did, did anything seriously recording wise, but I was just so excited about i mean it was a bucket list for me and rick to after the union tour we got a tour together and we got to get some stuff together we still want to do we we at some point we've talked about doing an album just acoustic guitar and piano but anyway um after doing uh the anderson raven wakeman thing the uh, he I said to the guys, he said, you must produce it and you must do the album. And I said, you know what? Um, it's just not the right time. I, I'm really not into doing it right now. And obviously management were pushing me to do it because there was advances and all this stuff. I said, it's not that it's, it's it would be ridiculous. It would be completely corporate drivel. I don't want to do that. And uh, so that was it. And I didn't do it. But I really liked 
this Thomas, the, the guy from the record company. And when I finished this album, <clears throat> well, it's never finished. You know, I always thought, well, I'm, I can't let go for at least another 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> but when I finally finished it and uh, g a guy that uh, helps me and mastered it, Paul, uh, my c guy who's done all my films with me, um, He's, I said to him, oh, you know, there's a, there's a symbol on toxic in the in the chorus. It's not loud enough. I've got to go back and do that. And he said, let it go. You've mastered the record. Let go. And I thought, you know what? He's, he's right. So I sent, I just called Thomas. I never looked at another label. I just said, Thomas, if you're interested in this, I'm going to send it to you. See, see what you think. I got to be honest. I thought he's going to say, you know, there's so many different styles. Uh, I, I don't quite know what it is you're doing. That was, you know, my, the half glass, glass half empty aspect of it that hit me. But uh, um, happily, he 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 liked it, and uh, I said, okay, well that's it. I'm not. I don't want to. I'm not sending it to anyone else. Um, and it was as simple as that because. There was no record company before that. I didn't want to talk to anyone one about it. I just wanted to do it, finish it, and uh, then I sent it off. It was really simple as that. So, but yeah, the genre thing. I I, I said it's. Uh, I I said to him, you know, instead of calling it Rio, which is my grand, my first grandchild, um, before that happened, I said maybe we should just call it the demographic nightmare. But <laughs> you know, we declined. Yeah, and um, wow. So let's talk about um about about the tracks on on this record. Let's talk about some of these songs. Yeah, uh, you know, first let's just. Talk, it's not enough to just talk about guitar with you on, on on so many fronts. But if we start at guitar, let's expand that a little to say strings. What do yes. play with strings? I mean, I mean, I hear I mean, there's guitar, there's banjo, there's dobro. Um, what what else do we have on here? The only string instrument that I don't play is violin, cello. I play double bass, but I don't play violin, cello, or viola. And uh, there's a phenomenal violinist who actually was in my orchestra for most of my movies, uh, Charlie Bisharet. And he's just, you know, when the orchestra would be tuning up, you know that sound when the orchestra's tuning up, it sounds like, you know, a ship going down or something. Um I'd, I'd always noticed, uh, and at the, the first time I heard it, he was in the second violins and progressed to the first violins within seconds kind of thing. But I heard this guy just playing this unbelievable, just, you know, warming up and playing this unbelievable stuff. And um, and he became the soloist on um, a, a lot of films I did, National Treasure, and he just a phenomenal violinist. And... Uh, so on push, he plays the violin on push. But yeah, I, I don't play violin. <laughs> my father was a magnificent violinist, uh, as was my brother, actually. But yeah, not not something I I, I could master. Yeah. Now, um, I noticed, um, you know, so if I go go through the track, starting on with big mistakes. Um, yes. You know, the obvious things, you know, the first thing that struck me was, oh, this is like the vibe of the calling from talk. But then we get into the, like the pre-chorus section, and you really channeled the Beatles with the string section in there. Yeah, that was that was so natural. I, you know, it's it's so funny because I don't even think about what I'm do doing. I just do it, and that's I, as someone that my else. In fact, it was my brother that said to me. He said, "Oh, it's, yeah, you, your voice sounds like McCartney." Then I say. Oh really? And I, I, I just didn't. Especially on this album, I never thought about trying to uh, look back at influences that have affected me. I just, I just played and and did it. And as uh, you know, the old Vinny thing, don't think about it. And I think that happened more than anything. But I, I hear what you're saying about the pre-chorus um, with that, uh, you know, and the bass is a, a melodic bass with the strings. Uh, so. I, I I understand it <laughs> at least at least. Yeah. And um now on push, um, let's talk about some amazing piano work. Um you oh, really thanks. showed people that you know you can shred on piano as much as guitar, I think. 
Yeah, it's it's weird because that's what I started with, you know. In in my household, uh, when I was growing up, my brother was playing piano at seven, and then I started at five, and I think I could read music before English. Um, and you know, I would, I thank him now, and he was my best friend, my father. But uh, at at an early age, he knew how important practice was, and if I wanted to go out and play with my friends, it's like. At six years old, it was half an hour of piano practice in the morning before school and half an hour before you go out and play with your friends. So that was my life from, you know, all my life pretty much and until I think I was 16 and uh, um, and I, I had a great teacher. I changed teachers. And then at 17, when I'd been playing guitar for three years, oh, my, my dad's um, – he would say to me, okay, you're going in for this piano competition. You're playing a difficult piece. It's Mozart's piano concerto in D major. I'll never forget. And he said, um, you're up against some stiff competition, but if you win, um, you know, you can, you can, I'm going to buy you a gift. And the gift was a guitar. And that was my first guitar. Um, so, and then I, you know, I started transitioning and, uh, by eight, 17 or 18, I was doing sessions every day of my life. And uh, it was really interesting because I went and I, I, I studied. I wanted, be, I wanted to be a conductor as much as anything. And I studied with this brilliant guy, Walter Money, who was uh, the dean at the University of Johannesburg. And he took me through, and I was a terrible student, but he was such a brilliant teacher. He took me through pretty much the, the Bachelor of Music um, uh, uh, curriculum, if you like, just as far as orchestration, conducting, and arrangement, in in no time at all. And then I joined this band Rabbit, which was a teeny bop, not a teeny bopper band, but the, I think the pictures sold as many as the records, kind of thing. <laughs> and, uh, and my father called me in and he said, uh, "I know you want to be a conductor and you're working hard at it, but." You know, he was the Johannesburg leader of the Johannesburg Symphony Orchestra for 15, 14 years. And uh, I was doing all these sessions and and uh, he was quite impressed with that. And rabbit thing was starting to percolate. And he said to me, I understand you can if you really want to do this, get to it later. But he said, I don't think you quite understand the amount of repertoire you have to retain to be a great conductor. And I thought, well, I don't want to learn everything. And at that point, it was I became a rock and roll musician. <laughs> nice. Uh -huh. Knowingly, should I say. Yeah. Now, the next song, the next song on the record, Oklahoma, of course, you actually opened talk, talk, talking about that. It's, it's such a gorgeous soundtrack piece. And because I, because I don't have a copy of the lyrics in front of me yet, um, I, I didn't even realize that it was reflecting on, on the bombing. I mean, which was so long ago that I think most people, when they hear that, would have the same reaction I did, which was, oh, my God, if somebody made a, a Western today called Oklahoma, this is the soundtrack. This is the theme song for that. Oh, film. Wow. Yeah. And there's pretty good, pretty good soundtrack for a film called Oklahoma, right? <laughs> Indeed. Wow. That, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, one of the lyrics which hit well, the first lyric that hit me is looking at, I, I thought, my goodness, looking at the, the, the graphics on TV, I thought, um, we'll get warmth from our wounds. And it just stuck with me. And so that became one of the lyrics uh, on it. Um, but the idea of that was to start uh, very peacefully with acoustic guitar, but somewhat frantically with a solo, and then just lead into a very gentle kind of... Uh, a journey if you like um but landing up with a horror of, but still the majest the majesty of uh, the spirit in 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 america basically and that's why the the theme is pretty americana and in, in fact um i've used a similar kind of thing in a, a movie it, it's so funny you say that because uh the movie was in a, uh, a western uh, I, I I use not exactly obviously the same, but that uh, you know the French horn, um, the size of the a beautiful French horn, my favorite instrument, um, 
and and you know that's it it rises to the end and you know the horror of the incident but the beauty of um of the majesty of this country you know it's almost a patriotic uh not certainly not a right wing patriotic journey but uh it's somewhat patriotic yeah now, now, coming from coming from South Africa, I am not a nationalist. <laughs> uh, now, before going through some more of the songs, I want to stop and talk a little bit about about some of the the instruments. Now, because yes. I notice I notice that um, well, of course, you've got musicians that have that have been with you for all of these years. I mean, you mentioning you know drummers Vinny Calyuta and Lou Molina. Um, yes, you know who've been playing with you for many, many years. Um, right. You know, your your son even appeared on on the last instrumental record. Um, yeah. So you you love sticking with with people you know, and and in our last conversation, it seemed you stuck. You like to stick with a lot of equipment that you know, and um. So I'm curious if if we're still rock. You know, I've seen the pictures. We're still rocking our same classic Stratocaster, and um, yes, and I'm wondering if we're using the same. Olymp Olympic bases, Olympic bases, and um, and tell me about some of the guitar and bass stuff you used on the record. Yeah, yeah, I've got I've got a number of instruments, but um, my go-to bass is always that Alembic, which I bought in I think nineteen seventy-eight or seventy-nine, and it, it was secondhand then, so it's from the seventies. It's a very old bass, and it's. I, it's the most wonderful bass guitar, and I've always just loved the sound of it. And uh, you can do anything on it. Um, um, and it's not a five string; it's just a four string. So you know, when I was using a five string, I would um, I would go to a different bass. Um, but yeah, that's that's my go to bass. I I love that bass guitar. I've I've used it forever. And uh, and yeah, and the Strat. Uh, that's you know that's still my old saddle if you like. Yeah, takes me everywhere. And now, did you record amps or are you doing all in the box? You know, guitar amp modeling now. Um, actually, amps um, on a lot of the songs, it's it's amps, but I do use the fractal as well, which is a, you know the multi thing. Um, I and amp wise. Um, I I used to for a long time on the road. I used a VT one twenty, the Ampeg. Yes. Uh, but uh, they are in the storeroom somewhere. I don't even know where they are. And all I have in my studio, I have an old Simswat from the sixties, and uh, um, and a Marshall. And at, I never forget um, when I was doing the solo on, on there's a song Tundi on the record and there's a solo at the end and uh, I just cranked the Marshall flat out, put a microphone outside the studio to, to get ambient and then didn't use it because there was too much and there was noise and cars were driving past. But uh, my wife was walking our dog up the road and she was about 100 yards away and she got home uh, uh, pretty perplexed. She said, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm recording. She said, but you didn't close your studio because the studio is totally soundproof. But, you know, if I open the door, it's not soundproof anymore. Yeah. And she says, I heard you right from the beginning of, of, of the street and you've been playing for ages because I started playing the solo and it was so loud. Uh, I had to kind of almost, you know, like glue the headphones to my head because I opened every door and just played um, to to that solo and I did the solo I think five or six times I don't even remember which one or combination I used but uh, I was just so enjoying playing it was like being back on the road and um, I played that solo five or six times so much so that when I took the headphones off and I closed the door uh, when I came to w reworking the song, I, I realized, wow, I played so loud uh, that I'd made a mistake engineering-wise because the the, 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 the power the boom, boom, from the amp um, was what was hitting me. Uh, and I, unfortunately, that didn't come through on the microphone. So it's a little thin on that song, but I thought 
you know, at the moment was such a good time. I'm just, I'm keep, keeping it. I try to fix it up, but it's, it's a little thin. Well, you know, still, you know, I actually comment noticed in my notes on, on that particular song that it really is. Yes. It is your, your classic or iconic lead tone. I mean, that, that is, was very much a definitive Trevor Rabin lead soloing tone. Oh, had. thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, once I'm playing the Strat and I go to, you know, the, I, I I go to the neck pickup and, uh, and the Marshall's on full. It's, it's usually does the trick. Um, <clears throat> I usually use, uh, for, for that sound or that heavy sound. Um, I'm usually using a DS one, you know, the Roland, uh, the orange guy, the fuzz box thing. That's usually part of the sound. Um, and I try not to use too much delay and reverb. Um, I, I use a lot of it, but I try not to make it so that it just drowns everything. Um, but that song I used very little. It's just the Marshall cranked and um, having fun. Yeah. One of the other interesting things that you did in that solo um, is a technique that that is really lost on a lot of a lot of shredders where you interspersed chords in the in in between runs um you know and you would connect you know oh, right, right. with chordal forms and like what kind of thought process goes into you know creating your solos or is it just completely inspirational in the moment it's it, it really is just inspirational at the moment um um, but you know, as far as chords and stuff, I'm an old guy and I taught Wes Montgomery. So, you know, that's where it comes from. Bad, bad, bad joke. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I just, I, I love doing that. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't go through things where, you know, I'll practice when I'm practicing, I'll, I'll go through the modes, but I don't spend in a tremendous amount of time, although that helps you, you know, um and navigate uh the neck uh, quite a lot better but when i'm playing solos it's just uh i love to you know there's a lot of pentatonic used and a lot of um you know quite a lot of semitones here and there um but it's it I, I like it to be as much connected to the chords and then you know pull the chords and go outside the chords so they're extensions and things um, and that's just uh, just is what goes through, I guess, my brain when I'm playing a solo. Nice. And um, now, you know, let's talk about you know, Paradise. Um, what what a yes. what a it was it was like Shania Twain meets Electric Light Orchestra. Oh, that's that's great. Actually, a very good friend of mine is Mutt Lang, so I got got to tell him that because he produced that, obviously. Yeah, and um, yeah, so. Really, how is it that you've you've know, been able to immerse yourself in so in so deeply in in so many different genres? Because you certainly haven't played all of these genres um, career wise. Well, well, certainly, and you know, not in the last. Uh, certainly, with no bands I've been with, I've obviously doing sessions. I mean, at some point in South Africa, I actually um, I did was doing so many session. Uh, uh, country sessions, um, and you know, in doing those country sessions, your bends and your pulls are very specific, um, and particularly your triad bends, or you know, I mean, the one bend within the triad. And uh, I needed more to make it authentic, and I got myself pedal steel, and I did pedal steel sessions for a while, but then I got so annoyed with that because you'd have to get to the session so early and tune not just six strings but all the pedals and the it was it was a bloody nightmare um so i stopped doing that and and you know i was doing sessions every morning every afternoon and one before rushing to the club to play um so it was it 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 was a lot of stuff so i didn't have the time to be hunking around that but i was so into country and i love some of the country pickers i mean even you know, even some of the more commercial um, artists and uh, Vince Gill, great voice, but he's also a magnificent guitarist. And there's there's so many of them. And uh, I used to love when we played in Nashville. I always used to go down 
uh, the, the, that's the, the, the street with all the pubs and listen to these great pickers. So I've always loved that. Yeah. And then, I, and you know, and then, you know, obviously Prague's in my DNA. So that's, that's kind of a natural place for me. But, um, and I've, you know, when I started playing guitar, I always thought, okay, to be a, I, I want to be a, a good guitarist. So, uh, it's kind of like, you know, I was at school at the time and a friend of mine was the best runner in, 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 in our grade. And he was an amazingly fast runner. And I thought, well, I guess if I want to win, um, I've got to be fast. So I really worked at technique and, uh, luckily I started that pretty early. So every time I practice, it's quite easy to go back into that and pursue that. Um, but, I, I very early learned that, you know, that's just one small aspect of playing. Um, unfortunately, the, a lot of new players think that that's everything. And uh, I don't want to sound like an old grouch, but uh, um, I think people, I think generally my thought is the guitar should be used as an orchestra. It should be look like a palette with different colors and it should be used like one would use an orchestra. You know, don't just stick to the one sound and and hit that, and then okay, and then you switch off the fuzz and the power, and you've got your jangly chorus, and those are the two sounds, and that's it, end of story. So I've never thought like that. No, well, the fact I, I think also the fact that you you conduct and you orchestrate, um, you you've got an ear for you're listening to the song as a whole and not just about. How do I make my guitar the best thing always? Yeah, you know, it's funny you say that because um, a guy who was going to manage me years ago, brilliant record guy, uh, Clive Calder, who's gone on to, I think he's a billionaire or something now from selling Zomba records, but he was going to manage me and he said, you know, you should really just concentrate on guitar and just play. And he was determined for me to just do that. But I could never really do just that because I always thought, no, the guitar must support uh, the song, not just play a solo in it. It should support it and complement the song like, you know, like a, an accompanist has to do when playing a duet with a violinist, if it's an accompanist. I mean, I'll never forget listening to Heifetz and complaining because the... Uh, accompanist uh, wasn't to his liking but he played everything so fast no one could keep up anyway so that was his problem yeah now you know vocal you know you did a lot of really amazing vocal work on this record and you know and think about like the song tumbleweed which opens with this massive you know vocal section um, right <clears throat> you know tell me about your approach to um, vocals on this record well, Tumbleweed was one in particular, which I approached it um, as if it was just going to be a cappella. I hadn't written the second part of it at all. I just thought, oh, I really want to do this thing with extended jazz chords and then, you know, some kind of pretty elements to it with just a simple love lyric. And uh, it took me quite a while because there's a lot of voices on it. And, you know, I don't like using that... Uh, uh, t tuning mechanism, I, I hate those things. And the one I have on my computer is dreadful because I don't use it. So every vocal that was slightly out of tune, um, I had to redo. So it took, took longer than it, it would have if I'd used the crutch, so to speak. Um, so that took me a long time. But once I finished it, I thought, wow, this is this is something I'm kind of I'm happy with. And then I wrote the song in, in inside it, which uh, I thought worked really well. And then I thought, how am I going to end this? And I basically took the beginning, the exact uh, beginning uh, of the, the a cappella thing, and just did it on jazz guitar at the end. And so, you know, those were the bookends to the song. That's, that's and, crazy because I, because I, you know, I really wasn't even thinking in terms of jazz voicings on the vocal line, but yet, but I, but my ear definitely picked up at the end, like, oh, and now Trevor's doing this jazz guitar 
here. And exactly. And I'm, I mean, I didn't have to write it. All I had to do is figure out how I'm going to play it and just do the beginning at the end. Well, you know, and that that's so much like an orchestra train, you know, different sections play the same part and, you know, it just hits you in a very different way. Absolutely. It's it's uh, com, com, that's exactly right. That's exactly what happened. Nice. And um, you know, now now something that I noticed as a general theme throughout the album, most of your songs, you love to start out with big, long, crazy instrumentals before before getting to the meat of the, of the song. Right. And um, now do, do the do those instrumental lead ins happen first do you come up with them after you've written the core of the song um you know did nobody tell you that songs don't have long instrumental intros anymore <laughs> um i was cognizant of that idea in fact i remember from years of making uh pretty much pop records um that uh oh no you can't use this within I can't remember what it was. 18 seconds. The vocals got to come in. The chorus has got to hit within 30 seconds or we're not playing it. You know, yep. I mean, those ridiculous um, rules. Um, and, you know, the, the thing with this album is I just did, I just came and did it. It's, it's, I know it sounds so simplistic. I, ju I just did what I thought, but um, I, I would just, at, at Tundi, for example, I would just get into this, thing and uh, to the point of okay i'm gonna do something ridiculous i'm gonna add this thing which i always love about the indian music that and i'm gonna use that in stereo talking to myself and but i'm gonna have this funky guitar and then i'm gonna then i'm gonna bash in with this uh, riff guitar and uh I wasn't even thinking of the vocals. I knew what they were going to be, but I just kept going, and uh, and then it comes in very solidly and and half the speed. Um, that's on uh, Tandy, but yeah, no, I I I think you're right. I I just didn't adhere to any of those rules. Yeah, and I hope yeah. that, I hope that doesn't hurt me. <laughs> No, no, that that's part of what makes it sound like you. Um, cool. <laughs> and, you know, the last instrument, you know, to talk about on this record, you know, going back to your keyboard work and the orchestral work, was all of the orchestra performed by you on, on, on keyboards with sampled instruments or did you actually have any live players on the record? Um, no, there's live players. Um, and... Uh... Uh, on Oklahoma, there's it's all live players, and um, and then on Push, there's live players, and then obviously Charlie's playing the violin solos. Um, I think the there's a there's a very soft string pad, which really just sits behind the guitars as 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 a support on Oklahoma, but it's barely audible, and that's a synth. That's that's basically string sounds, but real string sounds, but not played by real people. Oh, I, I'm so glad you said that because I was thinking, what sample library does Trevor have? Because these sound so; these are just too too real. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I I know some people have gone to such lengths to make them sound real, and and I've got stuff that sounds very real, and I mean I've been through couple of the movies this just didn't have the budget to have a real orchestra so i'd have to i would orchestrate and then i would just play them um and it's it's never as fulfilling as using the real thing and i don't care how much you spend and how much you do unless you want it to sound completely over over the top and not real um there's nothing like the real guys the you know the, the, all the waves bouncing off the different things and you know uh, the, the the french horns spilling into the trombone and you you can't get that unless it's the real deal yeah in my view <clears throat> yeah and so so what's so what's it what's next for you now that you've now that you've put the now that this record is coming out what what are you what are you hoping to do next 
Um, I'd like to start another album soon because I finished this one and I had so much left in the tank um, that um, I pretty much started, although a lot of it's very embryonic, but um, I really, I just, I want to get into another album. I, this was, uh, this, this was rejuvenating for me. So I want to do it again. Oh, that's awesome because it is a very fresh, up tempo inspired performance from start to finish. That um, oh, wow. you, know, you don't you don't expect you don't you don't expect you know an artist you know 30, 35 years you know since the last you know vocal rock record to put out something like this. You expect them to be, to be winding down, not firing it all up, and you know. Yeah, it. listen, and I'm I'm seventy in in uh, next year, and uh, it, it, oh, I must tell you one funny story, which I I was producing Manfred Mann, you know, five thousand years ago, and uh, I walked in, he was doing an interview with a punk, you know, kind of uh, Mohican red, and and he just really wasn't into anything Manfred was doing because Manfred was forty two at the time. It's like you're an old guy, you know. And his question was, uh, when are you going to retire and let the, the new blood through? And Manfred said, well, let me ask you this. Do you say that to your dentist? <laughs> and that's all he said. And the guy said, okay, I understand what you're saying. And he said, I'm a musician. I'm not going to change jobs because I turned 50. And uh, I, I just thought yeah. that was really quite charming, you know, and uh, – but it it is it is surprising that uh, you know I've I've done hundreds of hours of orchestral music with orchestra and dozens of albums and obviously many albums with uh, with the bands and and as solo artists and uh, you know millions of sessions um, from Michael Jackson to Tina Turner uh, Paul Rogers all of which I enjoyed um, you'd think. I'd be a little tired, but uh, it's as if I just started. That's well, how the feeling was on this album. Well, that's great, and I, you know, I, I look forward to, you know, I look forward to more. Even though right, right now, as of as of this moment when we're speaking, most people haven't even gotten to hear the rest of this album yet. You know that I've been listening to, you know, nonstop for the past for the past two weeks. Well, that's I, I got to tell you a funny thing. Um, when, and this happens every time I finish a record. You know, within a week of finishing it, I can't hear it. If I listen to it, it's just, it's not noise, but it's just, I, I can't I'm, I can't judge it at all. And then months go by and then, ah, and I'm starting to hear it. That's why I always hated uh, going to premieres because I'd sit there and all I'd be doing is listening to the score, which to me was just sound and uh Oh God! Why did I do that? That's the only input I had. So right now I can't really listen to it, but uh, but I am very happy with it. I was when 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 I finished and and my Paul said to me, "Just let it go. You're done." Yeah. I thought, "What? Yeah, I am done. I, f I feel good about it. I'm I'm good." <laughs> 